50 years ago, I was the archery instructor at Camp Powhatan, which is in the Blue Ridge Mountains Council. Was, I love that job. My favorite part of that particular job is that every Friday night, I got to shoot flaming arrows off of the high cliffs overlooking the lake during the OA ceremony. And boys, I'm going to tell you a little life tip right now. There are very few jobs in this world where somebody's going to let you shoot flaming arrows in close proximity to thousands of people and pay you dozens of dollars for the privilege. It was a wonderful, it was my dream job. And that's where this particular simple and yet horrifying story starts. It was 1969, the third week of camp, 8.30 at night on a Friday night, and I was working my way up a steep trail on the other side of the lake. I was holding in my left hand four arrows that had three sparklers taped to the end of it. Four arrows. I had an 80 pound bow in my hand. It's a bow that I had acquired at a yard sale and I'd shot it a few times at the archery range, but I had never shot it to launch these fire rockets off the mountain. So I didn't know what I was really dealing with. And if you don't understand what an 80 pound pull is, go to your grandmother's house, put your grandmother on the floor, tie a couple of ropes around her and pick her up like this a few dozen times. That's an 80 pound pull. Boys, this was a very powerful bow and arrow. Eventually I worked my way up to a little outcropping on the side of Jersey Ridge. Out in front of me, I could see the entire panorama of the camp spread out. The lake black, the big circular, with a little cove off to the side. There was a crowd of nearly 800 people straight out ahead of me. Mountains surrounded me, a locust thicket mountain with a moon coming up behind it. Chimney rock to my left, dead pine back behind me. Whippoorwills singing in every direction. Boys, is one of the most beautiful spots on God's green earth. There were three people shooting that night. There was a kid over in Rock Ridge campsite, and there was another kid, a new kid, who'd been begging me all week to shoot, standing on the dam. A 16-year-old kid named Jan Levin. I think he's dead now, so I'm going to tell this story in full daylight. I hope he's dead. He ought to be. He was a dangerous individual. <laughs> Boys, it began to get darker by the minute. And I could see the crowd across the way. They were doing songs and skits. And suddenly I heard Mike Kennedy's voice drifting across the way. And he was leading the Canadian paddle song. That was my signal to shoot the first arrow of the night. Our paddles keen and bright, flashing like silver. It was beautiful. It came rolling across like a fog in the mountains. And as soon as that song was over, I stuck that arrow down into a little red candle I lit at my feet. And those sparkles took off, and I held that thing up at a steep angle, pulled it back to full draw, and I let it go. I thought I had it at a sufficiently steep angle to work out. And the other two boys had already been told that their only job was to hit the lake and not to hit any canoes. Little did I realize that I was about, about to break both of those commandments in the next eight and a half minutes. <laughs> I got all set, that bow was up there and I let it go. Boys, that arrow just took off out of there like a scalded dog. It had places to go and things to do. I very nearly took out a 737 jetliner at 42,000 feet and it was still going up. And then it turned and it began to descend toward the earth at an incredibly high rate of speed. And as I watched it and I studied the various angles involved, I realized that that arrow is probably not going to hit the lake. In fact, it looked to me like it might land over on the dam. <laughs> and standing on the dam at that point in time was this little pitiful child named Jan Levin, holding his bow and his arrows in his left hand. He was looking up at the arrow that appeared from his angle that it was going to hit him right between the eyes. <laughs> he began to talk to the arrow which is strange behavior on the part of any human being. <laughs> Holy moly, mother of God! It's right on top of me! Son of a biscuit! Son of a biscuit! I found out years later he never actually mentioned biscuits or any other type of baked goods. <laughs> the arrow landed 18 and a half inches in front of his right foot 
So he was never in any real danger. It was just kind of a close call. When it hit the ground, it landed on a rock, and those three sparklers were thrown in three different directions. Boys, wherever those little sparklers landed, they started little tiny baby fires. Because the dam in those days, it was too steep to mow. It was covered with that old broom straw, broom sage, about three and a half feet tall. It's like somebody had soaked that stuff in gasoline. Because within about three seconds, those three little fires had joined together to create one massive conflagration. Jan began running back and forth like a squirrel on the interstate. He didn't know which direction to go in. In about 18 seconds, his clothes had been completely incinerated. Now he was buck naked, running around wearing a Boy Scout belt. He had a melted staff hat on his head and a pair of very smoky Converse tennis shoes. He was cussing like a sailor on shore leave, just running around like a crazy man. 230 yards away, the entire crowd of 800 people was watching this. With us, and they were transfixed. They had never seen such a rare and spectacular thing to see. In fact, the crowd decided that this had to be some kind of special effect, some kind of special effect just for them. And they stood up and they started giving the flaming child a standing ovation. Yay! Yeah! Yeah! This is amazing. Ethel, we're coming back up here next week. I want to see this again. We're going to bring Grandma and the dog. Almost as soon as the applause died down, so did the fire. Because it had burned up virtually every piece of grass that was available to burn on that hillside. Jan went skittering along the edge of Rock Ridge campsite. I could see him very plainly because his sparklers had become lit at some point. And you could see him just sparkling up through the underbrush. Heading back to staff camp, he was looking for some Rogaine or Vaseline or anything that might regrow some hair on his naked body. He was a sad individual. Up on the rocks, I was having a great time. I had gotten off two more shots during the, during the intermission there with Jan. And I had this bow dialed in. Although it was very tough to get an accurate shot when you're laughing that hard. <laughs> I knew that in my pitiful pinto bean sized brain, it would be fun to launch the last arrow. I had one arrow left. It would be fun to launch that last arrow directly at the highly stimulated crowd that was about 200 yards away. Boys, I got all geared up and I was ready to shoot that arrow that I realized I had forgot to sing the warrior's chant. It was a traditional song that we were required to sing, and it was my responsibility, and it triggered the great chiefs who were waiting just up the creek, waiting for them to come down. It was a song that I had learned from my old friend, Bill Irvin. Bill had learned it from Mike Kennedy. Mike Kennedy had made it up one night when he was up at the water tower drinking a whole bunch of old Milwaukee beer. So it was a song that not only didn't make any sense, but it was very hard to dance to. <laughs> what a heat <laughs> he done it. See, it doesn't make any sense. It's ridiculous. I saw the torches light in the canoes up the creek, and all of the great chiefs began moving down the way. I got geared up, and on the, I knew if I just shot the arrow absolutely vertical, that the crowd would believe that that arrow was going to come land on top of them. So I got everything lined up, got all my landmarks set, stuck that arrow down in that candle, and I was briefly blinded as those three sparklers took off, hot, sparkling everywhere. I pulled it absolutely vertical over my head, and then I gave it about a two-degree down angle, and I let it go. Boys, that arrow just took off out of sight. It was unbelievable. This was some kind of of a new world record. Back in those days, there were people actually trying to get to the moon. This was 1969. I imagine they were up there in outer space and they saw that arrow go by. They thought, Houston, we have a problem. Somebody from Camp Powhatan is trying to shoot us down 
with some flaming arrows. I missed him completely, but he gave him a moment's pause. That arrow was going to be up in the air so long, I realized it was probably going to burn out before it hit the lake. And I happened to glance down, and when I did, I was horrified to see that the lead canoe had gotten a lot further down the channel than I had anticipated. It was now sitting in what I used to call the POI, which is short for point of impact. It was directly below me. Boys, there were four canoes in that channel. Each one of them carried one of the great chiefs, Alawatsakima, Kitchkinet, Nunakit, and, uh, and that other guy. And they were all squatting there in the canoes. They were standing up like this with their arms crossed, and it was a very difficult thing to do. There were two other guys in each canoe. There was a guy in the stern paddling and a staff member up in the front holding this little goofy torch in his hands. And as they came down the channel, it was, it was a beautiful little parade. But that arrow came down within five and a half feet of that lead canoe. My friend Brad Roscoe was Alouette that night, and he's one of the best, best Alouettes we ever produced. But he was a big boy, probably weighed 280 pounds in those days. He was doing everything in his power to stand in that canoe without falling over. The guy in the front was blinded by the torch. He couldn't see the arrow coming. But the kid that was paddling, the idiot that was paddling that boat was looking at it like it was a messenger from God. And when it burned out about 80 feet over his head, he decided that life is too short. And he peeled out the side of the canoe. Looked like some kind of a moray eel slipping down into the waves. Now, when the kid in the back left the canoe, he created what I call a vortex of instability in the canoe. Roscoe, who was already a big child, fell forward like a giant redwood tree and crushed the kid holding the torch. The torch went flipping off through the air like some kind of an inebriated lightning bug. Roscoe all of a sudden found himself standing on the bottom of the lake in seven and a half feet of water. 800 million gallons of ice water surrounding the boy. I don't know what happened to the poor kid holding the torch. Brad had no choice but to try to swim to the closest shoreline, which happened to be the boating area, about 45 feet away. The other great chiefs kind of went completely around them. There was no attempt at a rescue. At that point, it was every Algonquin for himself. Boys. I had a ringside seat to this human tragedy that was taking place about 90 feet below me. Roscoe was swimming through the water. It was kind of a beautiful thing to see. He was wearing that brand new headdress that the ceremonial team had been working on for the last three and a half years. It held 4,500 turkey feathers in it. And when you dip a turkey feather in the water, it doesn't look like a turkey feather anymore. It looked like some kind of a big old bound up knitting needle. In fact, when Roscoe stepped out on the sand a few minutes later, he looked like some kind of a giant, deformed, insane, albino porcupine. It was horrifying. Roscoe turned around and he faced me up in the rocks. He didn't know exactly where I was, but he had a pretty good idea. And he said, he started speaking to me. I think he thought he was whispering, but he said, Hankins! I am going to kill you. And then he turned and he trotted back toward the fire that was about 180 yards away at that point. Now the other chiefs, the great chiefs, didn't know if Roscoe was dead or alive. They had continued around and they landed in the non-swimmers area. And they were ready to do whatever it took. The show must go on. And as they walked up to the campfire, they were surprised to see this giant white Native American swamp creature come staggering out of the darkness. There was Roscoe. He took his rightful place at the fire. He held up his arms to silence the crowd. And when he did, about 80 gallons of ice water came sloshing out of his armpits. Almost put out the fire. He had a couple of rainbow trout flopping around on the inside of his loincloth. He had a little baby snapping turtle up here on his shoulder crawling around. I don't think he knew it was there. 
big old pieces of seaweed hanging down below his knees. His glasses were all fogged up. But to his great credit, Roscoe delivered the speech he was supposed to deliver. Kitchkinette even had something to say. Nudikit came out and babbled about something. The other guy had something to say. It was great. The entire ceremony was flawless. Although everybody that was there that night commented about how easy it was to tell who had been tapped out that night because all those guys were soaking wet where they'd been slammed in the shoulder. You see, boys, back in those days, they didn't just tap you out. They tried to beat you down. They tried to break your bones and see a few internal organs flying around. They wanted to kill you. It's true. Today, in 2019, if you get tapped out, they just wave a little magic stick over your head. And they say, consider yourself tapped out. I'm not kidding. In 1968, when they tapped me out, it was my first year on staff. They knew who I was and they attempted to eradicate me from the face of the earth. They hit me over the shoulder with a six foot two by four, 343 times. Then they hit me with the broad side of a double bit ax. Then they hit me with the working end of a small McCulloch chainsaw. Then they threw a half a pint of gasoline on me and set me on fire. They wanted it to be something that I would remember for the rest of my life. And I have. I have never forgotten it. Appreciate it, boys. Well, ladies and gentlemen, make some noise for Mr. John Hayden.